we've already talked about one step that we need to go through to find black holes, which is to study the velocities of objects that are falling into a black hole by using the Doppler effect. The next thing we're going to want to be able to do if we want to figure out about the escape velocity of an object is to look at its mass. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the way we find mass of objects in space. This isn't something we've covered before, but this is how we find mass of pretty much everything in space. And this is something called Kepler's third law. Now, Johannes Kepler was an astronomer in the 16th century, and he is famous for having come up with laws of planetary motion. He put mathematics on his explanation of how the planets orbited the sun. And it turns out that what his descriptions were, not they don't just cover the planets orbiting the sun, they cover any object that's orbiting another object. For instance, something falling into a black hole, but it would also cover, say, a moon going around a planet, or a satellite going a planet, around a planet, or the sun going around the center of the galaxy, anything like that, because they're all rooted in the law of gravity, which is something that Isaac Newton later showed. Uh, Kepler had three laws that he came up with relating um, to planetary orbits. We're going to sort of focus on one of them. Now, one that we're not going to talk as much about, but the, his first law is that orbits are ellipses with, um, in the case of planets, there's the sun is at one focus of the ellipse. So this is like a mathematical ellipse. This isn't just some vague shape. This is a true mathematical ellipse. And hopefully you remember from math class that an ellipse, an ellipse there are two foci on either side of the ellipse. In the case of a planet going around the sun, the sun is at one focus, and then there's another focus that's just empty space, but nonetheless there is a focus and it exists. Something you're going to need to know about when we're talking about ellipses is that this long distance across an ellipse is called the major axis. The long distance across an ellipse is called the major axis, and half of that is called the semi-major axis. There's also a minor axis that's the shorter distance, but we're not going to really deal with that. So the major axis and the semi-major axis, this is going to be important. These are basically the distances that characterize an orbit. And distances between objects are something that we can successfully measure in space. Um, when we're talking about the semi-major axis, we use the symbol lowercase a. Um, you may have encountered a lowercase a when you studied ellipses in math, and it's that a. And you'll see the words orbital radius used for the semi-major axis. Um, that sort of assumes that the orbit is basically a circle, and so you can think of it as the radius of the circle. In the case of planets, um, other than Pluto, uh, which is only a dwarf planet now, um, the orbits really are pretty close to being circular. But for other things, we do get more elliptical shapes, so a semi-major axis is slightly more correct than calling it an orbital radius. It's also sometimes called the distance from the sun or the average distance from the sun. It is correct to say that it is an average distance from the sun. So in any case, you're going to see this various vocabulary. It all means the same thing. It's half of the major axis, and the symbol is A. Kepler's third law is a mathematical equation, and it's a pretty hideous mathematical equation. It's this monstrosity. The point is that it relates the orbital period and the orbital size. By orbital period, I mean how long does it take to complete exactly one orbit. And so we're going to represent that with the letter P for period. A, the semi-major axis, is going to come into it. And this automatically is showing us that um, for objects that are farther from the sun, it takes them longer to go around, which just makes pretty obvious sense. And then the masses of the two objects come in. This middle term here has a lot to do with the law of gravity. So g is the gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 
m1 is the mass of the thing that's getting orbited. So if this is a planet going around the sun, then m1 refers to um, the mass of the sun. And m2 is the mass of the thing that's doing the orbiting. Now when you do this equation, it's really important that everything be in the right units. And usually things are not going to be in the right units. So you're going to have to do a lot of conversions in these problems. You need to make the orbital period be in seconds, the mass is in kilograms, and the semi-major axis in meters. It's very important that you do all of that. Now something that's going to happen in a lot of our problems is that the mass of the central object, the thing that's getting orbited, is much, much, much greater than the mass of the thing that's doing the orbiting. For instance, if you think about the Earth going around the Sun, the mass of the Earth is way smaller than the mass of the Sun. Um, the Sun is about a million times more massive than the Sun, the, or than the Earth. So it's like adding a million plus one. Well, a million plus one is not that different from a million. And in some cases, it's even more extreme. So when we have a situation like that, where M2 is much less than M1, we just ignore M2 altogether. You're going to see that um, I do that in a lot of the example problems that I'm going to go through with you. And pretty much, you can do this unless it's a problem involving binary stars, uh, where the two objects are two stars orbiting each other. Well, two stars probably have about the same mass. It is not true in that case that M2 is much less than M1. So, um, and when we do black holes, we'll be dealing with binary stars. But there's going to be a lot of examples that we go through with this formula that will involve situations where M2 is much less than M1 and we can ignore M2. I'm going to do some example problems in the next lecture. So um, just make sure you've got all this and then we'll pick up with some example problems next time.